One of the things that really marks us as humans is our need to tell stories. As far back as we can remember, and certainly even longer than that, we have told and retold the stories of our ancestors, and quite often turned those stories and those people into larger-than-life heroes. Finn McCool, anglicized as Finn McCool, ranks as one of the greatest of these mythic warriors. His canon spans dozens of tales and possibly formed the blueprint for other grand legends like King Arthur. And like King Arthur, it is quite possible that the character of Finn was based on a real warrior whose deeds and reputation inspired many, many people to heap new stories on top of the facts over the centuries. So, come with me now and meet the great, the immortal, Finn McCool. Finn McCool's story, like that of many other heroes, begins with his parents. As the legend goes, the druid Taig Magnudat foresaw a prophecy that his daughter, Maureen Munchan, Morna of the Beautiful Neck, would give birth to a child, a hero, but that this child would result in Taig losing his home. So Taig refused to let anyone near his daughter. But a warrior called Kumal Maktrenor, leader of the Fianna Warband, laid eyes on her and instantly fell in love. Kumal asked Taig for permission to marry, but the old man refused. Unable to accept life without Murna, Kumal stole her away. Furious, Taig went straight to the High King of Ireland, Colna of the Hundred Battles, for help. Now, the Fianna were basically a sort of freelance army, ostensibly sworn to do the bidding of the king and to defend Ireland. But in going against the Druids, Kumal had crossed a line. So the High King agreed to help Taig remind the Fianna who was really in charge. He ordered a powerful rival to the Fianna, the Murna clan, to hunt them down. Eventually, the Murna and Fianna met in battle, and Golmak Murna, leader of the Murna, slew Kumal. Maureen was sent back to her father, Taig. However, she was immediately banished when it was revealed that she was pregnant. Taig hoped his daughter would perish in the wild alone. But Khan, the High King, intervened. He sent her to Bulmal, Kumal's sister, to live in hiding. Murna then gave birth to a son named Demne, with Bulmal's help raising him in secret. This opening chapter probably reminds you of the story of Arthur's father, Uther Pendragon, and his love affair with Igraine, and of course how Merlin took the infant Arthur away into hiding. But instead of a wizard, our young Irish hero had two women to watch over him. Bulmal took him into the mountains with a warrior woman named Lia Lucra, Lucra the Grey. And the two of them began teaching the boy the ways of both the druid and the warrior. At this time, Demne took on a new alias, Fion, or Finn, which means the fair, and this was due to his beautiful complexion. There's also a story of how the boy fought an evil spirit who turned him into an old man, but when the fight was over, the spirit returned Finn his youth, but his hair remained snow white for the rest of his life. When Finn came of age, he began traveling to different courts loyal to the Kumal family. However, Finn was sent away each time his true identity was revealed because no one dared to cross the king or the Murna. One of Finn's last tutors was the great druid and poet Finnegus, who lived on the banks of the River Boyne. Here Finnegus was searching for a magical fish, the salmon of wisdom. It was said to give whoever ate it all the knowledge in the world. So between lessons, Finn was ordered to fish for the salmon. One day, owing to the skills he'd learned from his foster mothers, Finn succeeded. Finnegus was overjoyed and ordered the boy to cook the fish right away. But he made him swear not to take a single bite out of the salmon. Finn, of course, being a devout student, immediately went to cook the fish as ordered. And all was going well, until a bit of hot fat happened to splatter onto his hand, burning his thumb. Instinctively, Finn sucked on his thumb to cool it. And in that instant, the magical knowledge of the fish was transferred to the boy. Finnegus was initially furious. However, after hearing how it had happened, 
The old wizard realized the magical salmon had probably been Finn's destiny all along, and he forgave him. Finn would go on many, many adventures, but you could say the one that really cements his hero's journey is his earliest great exploit, the battle against Aelin Macmigna. When Finn came of age, he at last returned to the court of the High King to demand his rightful place as leader of the Fianna. The warband was still at that time led by his father's killer, Gol Macmorna. The king saw the young warrior's honor and potential, but also needed to play it safe politically. Therefore, he decided that Finn should be given a quest to prove himself worthy. If he succeeded, Finn would be given a position in the Fianna. If he died, well, the king's problem just went away. The quest was to destroy a monster, Aelin Macmidna was a blight on the land. In truth, he was actually a member of the Tuart de Danan, the ancient clan of fairies who had first settled Ireland. Each year at the time of Samhain, when the veil between the worlds was thin, Aelin would invade Tara Hill, the home and seat of power of the High King. Aelin would play on a fairy harp, putting all the residents to sleep. Then, as his victims slumbered, he would burn the hill fort to the ground with his fiery breath. No warrior could defeat Island, for once they got within striking distance, Island would put them to sleep. Of course, Island had been tormenting the hill for years and years, and no one really expected Finn to be able to succeed. When Samhain came around, Island arrived on the hill, playing his harp as usual. But Finn was ready. He armed himself with a mighty magical spear. In some versions, the weapon is coated with a poison, the fumes of which keep Finn from falling asleep. Other stories claim Finn heated the tip of the spear and branded his own forehead with it to break the fairy spell. In either case, before Aelin could play another tune, Finn pulled back the spear and threw it across the night sky straight into the chest of the spirit flying above him. Aelin fell to the earth like a rock, completely dead. Immediately, Finn's renown spread across the land, and his popularity grew. So much so, in fact, that even Gol Macmorna, upon hearing of the great deed, stepped aside for Finn to take his birthright as the leader of the Fianna. Now, there are many, many other stories of Finn McCool, too many for us to cover in this particular video, but we do promise you some more storytelling in the future. The main point for right now is that Finn McCool was an integral figure in early Irish folklore and in time for the British Isles as a whole. He's a glimpse into some of the universal commonalities of myth and the heroic cycle. That's pretty complicated and it's often criticized as a concept. However, we can clearly see parallels between Finn and other heroes of antiquity. And two of these are actually very close to home, as it were, to Iron Age Ireland. The first is Beowulf. Beowulf is an Anglo-Saxon hero whose story clearly originated in pre-Christian times on the continent, even though the record we have of his saga was recorded by a Christian scholar in England. Like Finn, Beowulf is the leader of a war band. His basic job is to go around fixing things through either guile or brute force as needed. As noted earlier, Finn is assigned the task of destroying a monster which haunts a sacred home of a great leader, the High King. Similarly, Beowulf fights and destroys the monster Grendel, who menaces and murders the warriors of Herot, the Mead Hall of King Hrothgar. Where Aelin is said to be a survivor of the Tuat de Danan, the ancient fairy race of Ireland, so Grendel is said to be among the last of a race of trolls or giants. Both show utter hatred for humanity. Both are sort of primordial beings who represent chaos. And finally, both Finn and Beowulf are leaders of mighty war bands. Beowulf goes on to become a king, but is eventually felled by a dragon. Finn, on the other hand, is murdered by a king, in some accounts at least. Both embrace heroic yet tragic deaths, leaving their followers to wonder if they can adequately live up to the hero's legacy. And of course, there are plenty of other potential parallels. For instance, the story of the Salmon of Knowledge is suspiciously close to the story of the Germanic hero Sigurd, who at one point is cooking the heart of a dragon on the orders of his master, Regen. Sigurd checks to see if it is cooked by touching it, burns his finger, and sucks on it to cool it down. 
The dragon blood he thus ingests grants him the power to understand the language of birds, who warn him of Regan's treachery. Or you might even compare Finn being ordered to slay the alien to Hercules, being ordered by King Eurystheus to undertake his great twelve labors. In each case, the quests are presumed to be impossible by the monarch. But the single most popular comparison to Finn McCool is obviously King Arthur. Many have speculated that Arthur was in fact based on Finn, and it's easy to imagine. Both men come from impressive fathers who are themselves hero warriors. In Arthur's case, this is Uther Pendragon. Both are mentored by magical beings, the Druid women for Finn and Merlin for Arthur. Both undergo magical trials that prove they have a greater destiny. For Finn, it could be considered to be the Salmon of Knowledge. For Arthur, it is the drawing of the sword from the stone. Both lead bands of warriors who complete great deeds. Finn's Fianna or Arthur's Knights of the Round Table. In the end, both are betrayed by a lover and a trusted ally. And finally, and most importantly, both are said to be not truly dead, but merely slumbering until the time when their land needs them again. Now this theory has been challenged many times. There is simply no way to definitively prove it. And if you go by written sources, the mentions of Arthur actually predate written accounts of the Finn McCool stories. In Welsh sources, a pseudo-historic Arthur is portrayed as a post-Roman war leader who battles against Anglo-Saxon invaders in the late 5th and early 6th centuries. His name also occurs in early Welsh poetic sources, such as the E. Godwin. In Welsh mythology, Arthur is either a great warrior defending Britain from human and supernatural enemies, or a magical being associated with the Welsh otherworld, Anwyn. All right, so where does all of this leave us? Well, in my personal opinion, there is a sort of lineage or ancestry of stories dating back to tribal societies in Europe. It could have started with the Volsungs, including Sigurd or Beowulf, but I think those two are actually just other branches off of an even older tree of legends. I suspect there was once a Bronze Age version of this hero invented by a Germano-Celtic tribe who may have picked up the concept of Hercules from the Greeks. Maybe. In this hypothesis, the stories get passed around from campfire to campfire, from court to court, being retold by the local bards. The basic character traits and the story beats are retained, but the aesthetics change. And in more isolated parts of the old Celtic hegemony, like Wales and Ireland, maybe the preservation is actually a little bit better. My gut tells me that Finn is a more pure form of this hero than Arthur. So who is Finn McCool then? Well, he's a mythic aggregate, a heroic archetype. Anyone familiar with the work of Joseph Campbell may be familiar with this idea. However, I feel Campbell's theories can get problematic, so we'll keep it simple. Once upon a time, or not, a war chief in a pre-literate society did some really big things, and someone related those stories to someone else. A lot of folklore is, after all, really a telephone game, a whisper down the alley kind of an experience. So the germ of truth was about someone who was a successful warrior, but the stories were embellished over a period of hundreds or even thousands of years. That's just how these things go. And as fewer and fewer people could relate the story exactly with actual events or with actual people, they started to substitute ideals of their culture for personality. So being strong becomes being the strongest of them all. Being lucky or a bit clever becomes having the blessing of the divine or being incredibly clever. And since most folks aren't really clever at all, there's probably some reason for this, some really cool reason why. Hence, magic fish. And if such a mighty superhuman is going to be taken down, it has to be by something that your culture really, really despises. And almost any society, then or now, betrayal, the breaking of oaths, is among the very worst of sins. So the character becomes a hero with a capital H. He's entertaining, but much more than that, he's an example, a parable, a lesson that reinforces your culture's values 
This, after all, is why we still love all these characters and keep inventing new ones. And speaking of inventing new ones, another factor that came into play as society got more and more complex was romanticism. A nostalgia for a past that never was, when things were clearer, simpler, and more exciting. This is borne out by what happened to the Finn McCool canon of stories over the centuries. For example, at some point, someone decided Finn was not just a man, but actually a giant, like a literal giant. In this particular legend, Finn took on the evil giants of the land, seemingly a concept borrowed from Norse mythology concerning Thor. The story explains that a battle between Finn and a particular giant named Brannandonar resulted in Finn creating the basalt rock formation called the Giant's Causeway. Much later, the nostalgia took full control. In 1762, a Scottish poet named James Macpherson, quote unquote, discovered something incredible. Macpherson claimed to have uncovered the lost writing of Finn's son, Oshin. Macpherson published his works under the title Fingal. This collection was basically a long epic in the style of Homer's works, and it used much of the Irish mythology while also weaving in other stories from Ulster. While Macpherson's work obviously was a mix of imagination and early stories and not a direct retelling of long-lost Gaelic poems, their popularity spread the name and the myth of Finn McCool to a whole new audience. Macpherson's work was heavily critiqued for confusing the narrative of Finn McCool, basically mixing together several Irish cycles, the Fenian and the Ulster. Being a Scottish poet, Macpherson also changed the characters' backstories, making them all Caledonians, in order to weave their exploits into Scottish folklore rather than Irish. Macpherson updated the spelling of many names in his epic to reflect his own culture, for example, Oshin becoming Ossian. With time, these names became very interchangeable, further confusing the narratives. One workaround has been to refer to McPherson's work as the Oceanic Ballads. And another major difference you can spot is that while in the original poems we see pagan and Christian cultures intermingling with a mutual understanding, in the ballads these cultures are most of the time at odds. So there you have it. The legend of Fimicool is so strong that everyone kind of wants their own version of it. They put their own emotional needs into it, and they romanticize it to fit their own needs. All of this underscores what we have said from the beginning, that storytelling is a fluid, creative process. It's an evolution. Epic heroes like Finn McCool, or if you call him Fingal, or Finn Macuil, however you say it, his story, like all these others, will stand the test of time because they already have. While the shape of the man may change between the stories, the messages always stay the same. Be brave, be kind, but most importantly, be clever, and make sure there's someone around to tell your story. Thank you for joining me. Did you grow up with any of these Irish myths? Did you know who Finn McCool was? If you hadn't before now, please check out the recommended reading we'll have in the comment section below. And if you want to hear some of our other Irish legends and Irish history, check out the other videos on this channel. Remember, we are always putting out new content. We want to know what you think. We want to know what you would suggest us to cover. And we look forward to seeing you the next time and the time after that for Time In Memoriam.